Welcome everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Elizabeth Brentfro and I'm the Family Consumer Science Extension Agent through the University of Tennessee um, Extension Services here in Washington County. Um, I'm housed in uh, Jonesboro, but um, I come to you today from um, my home office since um, we are uh, in the coronavirus age. So, but um, this evening what we're going to be discussing is the freezing and drying of Food Preservation 101. So this uh, session is being recorded and it will be posted or shared onto YouTube and of course shared on uh, our Facebook page uh, for those of you that may have to get out a little bit early or have come in a little bit later. Also, um, all the information within this class is for educational purposes only. Any reference to commercial products or trade names does not imply endorsement by UT Extension or bias against those not mentioned. This evening, we are going to start off with um, freezing. And so, you know, freezing is probably one of the easiest and least time consuming ways to actually preserve food. And, you know, many advantages to freezing food. So actually a lot of foods can be frozen. There are some that cannot, and we will go over those here in a little bit. They also help, uh, it also helps retain its quality. Uh, it gives a little bit better texture and then um, can take less of your time in doing this. Some disadvantages, of course, are in some of the foods, there could be texture changes that are not ideal for a lot of people. Also, the cost of the freezer. Um, so depending on the size of freezer that you want and the type of freezer that you want can help, uh, can be a big disadvantage. And then also um, storage space. So the size of the freezer that you decide to get uh, can be a disadvantage. And uh, it can also the limit the amount of food that you can hold within that freezer. So, you know, one of the big questions a lot of people have is does freezing kill microorganisms? So freezing actually does not sterilize foods. So the extreme colds actually slow down the growth of microorganisms and so, um, so that they don't produce any of the toxins that they might have or multiply. Also, um, if the food does reach a high enough temperature, uh, you know, say that your freezer stops working or the electricity goes out or something like that. If the temperature within the freezer gets above 40 degrees, um, your food can't, or the microorganism can start mu multiplying. So you want to make sure um, that you want to keep your frozen foods at zero degrees Fahrenheit or below. And so typically those that are kept at zero degrees Fahrenheit and below are uh, safe indefinitely. The problem is, is keeping the food for long periods actually changes the quality of that food. And so one of the big uh, quality things that can happen is freezer burn. Also another thing with freezing is the enzymes. And so the enzymes can change the quality of the food. And enzymes are little small proteins that are found in food that start or contribute uh, to un undesirable changes in frozen food, such as the browning or the flavor and also can change the color of that food. Um, and it can also cause some loss of those nutrients. Um, but freezing actually slows down some of these chemical changes and um, that affect quality or can cause food spoilage. In the enzymes that are found in vegetables, uh, they're actually inactivated whenever you heat it up. So you wanna make sure that you blanch your um, your vegetables before you actually freeze them. And so one good example is corn. So corn, if you don't actually freeze, if you don't blanch it before you freeze it, um, it could, you know, when you do pull it out to enjoy it, you know, in the fall uh, months or the winter months, um, it may not taste very good at all. Uh, and that's because you didn't blanch it to stop those enzymes. And so blanching is one of those where um, we will dip the, uh, vegetables in boiling water for a certain amount of time and then um, take them out of that water and it's usually about two to three maybe four minutes um, in that boiling water and then we pull it out and we put it in an ice cold water bath uh, to stop the cooking. So this is essential uh, to keep the quality 
of that frozen vegetable. And like I said, blanching does destroy microorganisms that are on the surface of that uh, vegetable and help stop that enzyme. If you over blanch, um, it can actually re result in a loss of flavor, color, and nutrients. And if you actually under blanch them, it will stimulate the enzyme uh, activity and it can actually make it worse um, than if you didn't blanch at all. The enzymes that are found in fruits um, are ones that are caused the browning or the loss of vitamin C. And so um, a lot of fruits are typically not blanched um, because most people prefer that undercooked texture that they have. So instead of blanching, the enzymes are controlled uh, by using chemical compounds. And so a lot of people will use um, what they call fruit fresh uh, to prevent that browning, or they'll dip them in some kind of uh, lemon juice or pack them in syrup um, just to prevent that browning. And so, um, the fruit fresh is part of an exorbic acid and so this like i said it helps control um, that enzyme and so you want to make sure that the exorbic acid that you purchase is also food grade safe another thing that can happen with your uh, frozen foods uh, during uh, freezing is rancidity and so you'll commonly find this in meats um, that are very high, uh, high fat and, and actually exposed to air over time. So it actually decomposes, creating a chemical change that will affect the taste and odor um, of that meat. And so if you've ever um, have tasted or smelled rancid meat, it's not the most pleasant. Um, a lot of times I tell people, um, to me, it smells like baby vomit. <laughs> so I know that's not a nice picture, but that's kind of um, what it does smell like uh, and even taste like. So when you do pack um, your foods, you wanna make sure that you try to remove as much uh, air as possible out of that freezer bag or container that you're using. Also, um, to prevent any texture changes or significant texture changes, you wanna try to freeze your food as quickly as possible. So um, the ice crystals that are formed in food, um, which is, you know, there's water activity in food, and so that water will produce ice crystals and it will actually um, break the cells of the wall. And so that's why some foods, um, you know, when you, all them out they'll be very mushy um, it's because it's um, broken those or ruptured those cell walls so um, typically those foods with very high water content um, are not very good to, to freeze and a good example is tomatoes um, so when a tomato is frozen and thawed it actually turns into mush and liquid and also celery and lettuce don't freeze very well either a lot of times um, with fruits, uh, you, they're better served when they're partially thawed. So um, I'm one of those that, you know, I like frozen cherries. And so um, you want to make sure that they're uh, partially thawed because um, the texture is less noticeable um, at that stage. Uh, when you cook your foods before eating, the changes in the texture are not as noticeable. And the reason being is because uh, cooking actually softens the cells wall, cell walls. So you can't really tell. Also, another good um, thing that uh, freezes very well are those high starch vegetables. Um, and they're less noticeable. So peas, corn, and lima beans, they freeze fairly well also. You wanna freeze your foods as quickly as possible. Like I was saying before, um, the slower that, you, that they're being frozen, uh, the more likely they are to produce those larger um, ice crystals. And so it can rupture um, more of the cells and cause more of that uh, mush that you're not looking for. So what you could do is you set your freezer um, at the co coldest setting a few hours before you actually put um, the food to be placed in that freezer. Um, and if you, especially if you have several packages. One of the other things that can help uh, that um, can affect freezing is the temperatures, um, it going up and down. And so um, this does affect the quality of the food. So ice in the food thaws a little and then it actually refreezes. So each time that this actually happens, um, those ice crystals get bigger. And so 
um, the food actually becomes more mushier and the large um, ice crystals growth will damage the cells more um, over time. So if you keep um, freezing and refreezing that, that same item, you'll eventually just have mush. So it's good to invest in a freezer thermometer. Um, you know, you just, you know, a lot of freezers will have the manufacturer thermometer in there, but it's good to have one that you invest in, especially for um, if there was to be a power outage, uh, you can actually open up the freezer and see what the temperature is on that gauge um, just to make sure that your food is uh, staying at a consistent temperature. So um, green beans, for example, um, if they're stored at zero degrees Fahrenheit, um, they're good for at least one year. If they're stored at 10 degrees Fahrenheit, they're good for three months. If they're stored at 20 degrees Fahrenheit, they're good for three weeks. And if they're stored at 30 degrees Fahrenheit, they're good for about five days. So you can see, um, you know, the temperatures that, that it can actually extend, extend the shelf life of certain fruits and vegetables. With moisture loss, you, um, you run the risk of freezer burn. Um, and so this is where the moisture on top of the surface of the food is lost. And so a lot of times you'll get that brownish spot that appears grainy um, where tissue has become dry and tough. And also freeze dried area is very likely to, to develop those off flavors, um, but it doesn't make you sick. So it's just, um, it's more of a flavor thing that happens. So you wanna make sure that you package your food in a very uh, heavy weight and moisture resistant wrap to prevent those freezer burns. So if you are using um, Ziploc bags or something along those lines, you just wanna make sure um, that they're freezer bags because they have that moisture vapor barrier uh, to prevent that from, for, to prevent moisture loss. So, since freezing doesn't actually destroy uh, microorganisms, it's important to remember that there are sufficient numbers of microorganisms on the food to multiply and can cause spoilage when it thaws. So that for this reason, we never recommend for individuals um, to thaw their food outside of the refrigerator unless um, we do it in a microwave and cook it right away or thaw it in a sink of cold water that is changed frequently. So um, a lot of times, you know, if you're going to know if you're one of those meal planners and you know what you're going to eat throughout the week, um, you can um, thaw your food out in a refrigerator. That's the best option. That's the safest option. Um, if not, if you're one of those that sometimes you're just like, I don't want um, what I have in the refrigerator. I want, I want to cook something up really quick that I have in the freezer. Uh, microwave is your next be best option. And of course, the kitchen sink. Um, you want to make sure that you replenish and change out that water um, every 30 to 45 minutes, uh, that cold water. You also have different options for deciding what kind of freezer uh, you're wanting. Uh, the most popular right now seems to be the upright freezers or uh, refrigerator type freezers, um, those combinations. And the other option is the chest freezers. So. You know, the upright freezers are the ones that, um, they take up less space. So if you don't have a lot of space, um, you know, this may be a good option for you. Whereas the chest freezers typically take up a lot of space, but you can actually, you can store more stuff in those chest freezers. The upright freezers, you actually lose a lot more of your coldness whenever you do open up the doors. Um, whereas the chest freezers, you don't lose as much of that coldness. Um, so you have to be very mindful of it. It's more of a preference. What is it that you like um, and what is best going to fit um, your lifestyle? You also want to make sure that you uh, keep your freezers in a cool, dry, and well-ventilated place. Um, you don't ever want to put it next to a stove or a water heater um, just because of the heat that comes off of those um, items. So um, sometimes as extension agents we do get calls especially if there's been a power outage or bad weather or anything like that. Um, people have lost their electricity. You know what do I do if my freezer actually stops working? Um, those are some questions that we get. So for meat, pul meat and poultry um, you can refreeze it if the freezer temperature stays at 40 degrees or below and if color and odor are good. 
Um, you want to check each package and discard any signs of spoilage, such as an off color or odor that's present, and discard any packages above 40 degrees Fahrenheit or at room temperature. For vegetables, you can refreeze only if those ice crystals are present or if the freezer temperature is at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below and discard any packages that show that signs of spoilage or um, that have reached that room temperature. And then shellfish and cooked fish, uh, you can refreeze those only if ice crystals are still present or the freezer is at 40 degrees or below. If that temperature is above 40 degrees, uh, you want to throw those food items out. So you'll see why you see why it's important to have a backup uh, freezer thermometer. For fruits, um, you can also refreeze these if they show no signs of spoilage. So thawed fruits may be used in cooking or making jellies or jams or preserves. Uh, fruits survive thawing with le uh, least damage to their quality. Ice cream, if it is even partially thawed out, you want to throw it out. Um, and the reason being is because the texture of the ice cream is not acceptable after thawing. And if the temperature goes above 40 degrees, uh, it could potentially be unsafe. Those cream foods, those puddings and cream pies, uh, you can refreeze only if the freezer temperature is at 40 degrees or below and discard if the temperature is above 40 degrees. And so breads, nuts, doughs, cookies, and cakes, uh, these foods refreeze better than most do, so they can be safely refrozen if they show no signs of mold or growth. Um, so you can kind of see that that 40 degree mark is kind of the, the mark that you don't want to go above. If you do, um, then you will have to get rid of those food items. So the other thing is removing odors um, from your freezer. So if, you know, there was something if your electricity went out or something like that and all the food um, in that freezer goes bad, um, you know, how do you remove those odor odors from that freezer? So you can actually use baking soda. Um, you can use uh, vinegar. So uh, kind of a mixture that you can use is one tablespoon of baking soda and a quart of tap water or with one cup of vinegar and a gallon of tap water um, and allow that to, to dry on the surface. You can also use activated charcoal um, to help absorb those odors. Some other things that you can also use um, is newspaper. So just crumbling up old newspaper and putting it in there. Another option um, that you can use is actually uh, cotton balls with vanilla on it um, will help with the odor in, um, in your freezers or even refrigerators. So with freezing, um, you do want to make sure that you're looking for containers that are moisture vapor re resistant. So uh, those containers that you're looking for will have the freezer uh, emblem on them to let you know that it's okay to use um, to freeze items. You want to make sure that they're durable and leak proof, uh, that there's no brittle and cracked or at low temperatures because uh, some containers are not designed um, to withstand uh, extreme temperatures. So whether it is uh, cold temperatures or even hot temperatures um, that are resistant to oil, grease, or water. Um, one of the big things, of course, is oil and grease. Uh, sometimes those things like, um, or change the color of it. Uh, so if you're making like a tomato sauce or something like that, uh, tomato sauce are notorious for changing the colors of um, plastic containers. Also protecting food um, from absorbent of off um, flavors or odors. And then also they're easy to seal and they're easy to mark. Um, so it is very important that any food item that you freeze and you're um, putting it in your own containers or your own freezer bags, that you mark what it is. Because um, I can guarantee you, I'm, I'm guilty of it too, that I put something in the freezer and I haven't marked it and I pull it out and I had no idea what it is. So you, a lot of times you'll have to thaw it out to figure out what exactly it is. So it's important to mark those um, and also put the date that you put it into the freezer or that you made it, um, just so you know how long you've had it for. So um, the rigid containers 
are, um, they're either made of plastic or glass. And so you'll kind of see an example up here. A lot of times they'll have straight edges and that's because it just makes it easier uh, to get the food in and out. A lot of times they'll have the big openings on them um, just so that you can get them out in and out of the, the containers easily. So, um, and a lot of them are reusable. Um, so uh, like I was saying, it makes it just easier for you to stack those. Uh, cardboard cartons of ice cream, cottage cheese, and milk are not sufficiently moisture vapor resistant enough for long-term storage unless they're actually lined with a freezer um, bag or wrap. And you can also use uh, canning jars. Um, so if you'll notice a lot of the canning jars here lately, you can use them for canning or you can use them for freezing. Um, so those are have been coming out here. I've kind of noticed them in the past five or six years. So <clears throat> If you have older canning jars, um, I would just be mindful of that. But if you have more of the newer ones, um, those you can potentially use uh, in the freezer. But you also wanna uh, maintain a headspace in those containers. So leaving anywhere from a half an inch to one and a half inches um, from the top of the food to the bottom of the lid, just because that expansion and contraction of the liquid. So as uh, liquid uh, freezes, it's actually going to expand. And if you filled up your container all the way to the top, it will bust off that, bust off that lid. Um, and you can have, you know, if you're freezing, um, if you, you know, blackberries will come in season here pretty soon. And some people like to mash up their blackberries and put them in containers. Um, if you filled it up all the way and you <laughs> didn't leave that headspace, you're just gonna have blackberry juice all over um, your freezer. And that's no fun to try to clean up. The other option um, is to use the flexible bags or, or wrappings. Um, if you do, they do make a plastic freezer wrap. They also make a freezer paper. And then if you use aluminum foil, just make sure that you're using the heavy weight aluminum foil. Um, and it just to help, it has more of a moisture barrier on it to prevent that um, uh, freezer dryness. And then um, also bags can be used uh, for liquid packs. So a lot of times the bags, um, you'll see a lot of people, they will, like if they do their soups and things like that in Ziploc bags, um, they'll actually lay their Ziploc bags down um, just so that, and then when they're frozen, they're able to kind of stand them up um, so that um, it, they're easier to store. You can actually get more um, packages in there. And also you can use uh, vacuum seal devices and I've actually have one back here behind me and I'll show you that um, here after the PowerPoint presentations. Some foods that don't actually freeze very well are lettuces, uh, cabbage, celery, cucumbers, uh, cooked macaroni, spaghetti, or rice, um, egg whites that are cooked, meringues and icings made from egg whites, Irish potatoes cooked or boiled, and fried foods except for French fried potatoes and onion rings. So this is if you're actually doing it at home. Um, the commercially um, frozen products are a little bit different. They have a, um, they're able to do like flash freezing. So it's like instant freezing um, where when we do this at home, we don't have that um, technology. Um, it's also best um, to season foods lightly before freezing and add any additional seasoning, seasonings when reheating or serving. So garlic, um, peppers, and some herbs, they get strong and bitter. Uh, spices become stronger and develop off flavors. And then salt um, loses flavor and has the tendency to increase the rancidity of any items that contain it. So when you're freezing your fruits, um, there are a couple of different options. So there's the syrup pack um, where you are making a syrup of basically water and sugar. Um, and then you are um, packing that with your fruits. You have the sugar pack, which is just basically, um, you know, strawberries are, in, are coming in season, season here in Tennessee. And so a lot of people, you know, if you're going to make like a strawberry shortcake, they'll typically just um, drizzle a little bit of sugar on top to help draw that moisture out of that strawberry. Um, so that's what they call sugar packing. So you're using the, the moisture that's already within that fruit 
um, along with just sugar. Then you have the dry packing and, dray, and tray packs. And so that's where um, you're individually putting, um, you know, you have a cookie sheet that has a little, some slides onto them. And so you're individually putting, whether it's strawberries or blueberries or blackberries, um, and you're leaving space in between them and you're sticking that tray in the freezer and you're allowing those um, fruits to freeze. And then um, when they're frozen, you pull them out and you stick them in the bags. And so the good thing about that one is if you only want like half a cup of berries, you can just grab um, the measuring cup and scoop it out and then put it into like say a smoothie or something like that. Um, whereas the more of the unsweetened type packs, those are, um, you know, if you're putting, you know, this past weekend I did strawberry jam and I had strawberries left over. So I put, you know, those four cups of strawberries that were left over into one package. Um, so the, ba the bad thing about that is, you know, I can't go in and just get out a half a cup of strawberries. I have to unthaw the whole thing in order to get those strawberries out. Um, but my plan with those strawberries is to use those later on to either make, um, you know, strawberry shortcake or more jam or something like that. Um, typically those fruits that are packed in syrup are ones that you want to make sure that um, they, um, they freeze really good at a 40% um, syrup concentration. And so what I'm going to show you all really quick, um, and you'll have this link uh, later on um, in the presentation to get to, but for this one, it will have, and this actually comes from the University of Georgia, and here um, they have listed here for you all, and we also have it in our um, publication in Freezing Foods. Um, and you can have access to that with the University of Tennessee Publications um, website and just type in freezing foods. But here it will have um, the different percentages of sugar. Um, so you'll see here is a 40%, so it's more of a heavy type syrup. Um, so basically what it is is two and three quarter cups of sugar to four cups of water. And so you get five and one third cups of that heavy syrup um, that you'll need. So, and also down here, it kind of lets you know what kind of headspace that you need um, for whenever you are packing those, um, those fruits and that syrup. So your vegetables, um, so when you're freezing vegetables, make sure that you start off with the best quality. Um, as possible and select the type of vegetables that are more suitable for freezing. You want to wash and drain all your vegetables and then also work in small quantities to retain those moisture contents. Um, so blanching is going to be very crucial uh, for vegetables. So you can either do water blanching, uh, steam blanching, or microwave blanching. So this just helps slow down um, the loss of vitamins and also um, stops the, in, the enzymes. So there are um, a couple of different ways to pack your, your vegetables. And so that's the dry packing or um, the freezing pack or tray packing. So the tray packing is very similar um, to what you do with um, the fruits. So Anastasia, is there any questions about freezing? I have not seen any come up in the chat, but if you have some now, you're welcome to enter them. Yeah, so if you have any questions about freezing, just go ahead and enter them to the chat. And while that's happening, I'll transition into um, the drying PowerPoint. Okay, so um, if any questions do come up, you'll have an opportunity at the end of the presentation also um, about that. And so 
Drying is actually probably one of the oldest methods um, for food, preserving foods. And so some advantages of drying um, is it's fairly simple. It does take up less storage space. Um, it's typically easier to transport those items. You typically have a fairly long shelf life with them. Uh, it takes few supplies and equipment as needed, and then also few added ingredients uh, to those items. Some disadvantages is it does take time uh, and foods actually need to be checked throughout. So it could take potentially up to 24 hours, if not more, um, to actually dry some foods. Um, you don't wanna have any interruptions whenever you are drying foods, but there are times, um, depending on the food, that they want you to check it every so often. Um, for example, when we kind of get to the jer um, beef jerky or jerky portion of this, um, it says to you know initially check them at three hours. Um, to see where you're at. Um, procedures can actually vary um, between um, the method that you want to use or the equipment that you're using um, or the brand of dehydrator that you're using. You will have some nutritional loss and then also um, it can be very expensive depending on which um, equipment that you're using for that. So a couple of things that's not recommended for drying are milk and milk products and eggs um, for home drying because of the high risk of foodborne illness. Uh, commercially dried milk and egg products are processed rapidly at very high temperatures enough to prevent bacterial contamination, which you can't duplicate with home dryers. So um, funny enough, I actually did work in a milk processing plant where um, long time ago where we actually did do dehydrated milk and so or instant milk and what it is is it's um it, it's basically a big gigantic room <laughs> and um, they have a big huge vat in it and they basically um squirt the milk into this big huge uh, area and there's so much heat in this room that whenever that milk hits that dry area or air, it instantly dries. And then it just falls to the bottom of this vat um, and they're able to package them into, into bags. And so eggs are, are done similar to that also. So, but we don't have, um, we're not able to do that in the home because um, we just don't have that type of equipment. Some fruits um, that are unsuitable, of course, are avocados and they're because they're very high in fat. Um, berries with seeds, unless, um, I should say berries with seeds or citrus fruits or crab apples or uh, guaves or pomegranates, um, those are typically, you can do those if you're gonna put them in a fruit leather, okay? So if you're gonna make um, like a fruit leather, those type of things, um, those typically go good in those. Um, olives, they have a very high oil content um, and quince are also, um, they're very hard and strongly acidic, so they're good whenever you do um, put them in a fruit leather. So some characteristics um, for unsuitable types of drying, they typically have a very, um, their water content, their fat content, their seed content, and their flavor um, is what makes them unsuitable. For vegetables, some examples of those, um, typically their water content is too high. Uh, they may have surfaces or layers that are difficult to dry. The flavor may be undesirable, or you may end up with a product of poor quality. So some unsuitable vegetables are like broccoli, lettuce, radishes, and then also winter squashes. Those that do poorly um, are leafy greens. They dry poorly as well as Brussels sprouts. Uh, cauliflower, celery, and also cucumbers. So with drying, basically what you're doing is you're reducing that um, water activity. So you're removing that water activity or you're binding it. Um, so when you're pulling out that water, you're concentrating um, a lot of what the sugar content is, you know, more specifically in, in fruits and things like that. And so um, that sugar binds the remaining of that water activity. So um, it helps prevent um, microorganisms from growing. So basically any method that removes water from food or reduces the amount of available moisture is a form of drying. So for example, salting meat or seafood which draws moisture from the flesh is a form of drying. Okay. 
So um, with pretreatment, uh, you want to stop that enzyme activity. So you want to remove the water, um, pretreat it, pretreat most foods as necessary to help stop that enzyme activity and also minimize any oxidation uh, reactions and to decrease any microbial load uh, population that may be on the surface of that food. So pretreatment can also decrease microbial load on the surface of the um, food and also pretreatment primarily helps maintain the food quality and it also helps retain maximum nutritional value, flavor, color, cooking, and other qualities. So the methods of, of drying foods, of course, is the temperature, the air circulation, and wanting to prevent uh, case hardening. So you wanna choose um, to dry foods depends on the several factors. Um, so the final quality desired is time available, uh, the money that you want to invest, and weather conditions. So factors that need to be controlled is a major, major consideration when choosing a method. So temperature is important um, and will vary from, with the food and the method used, but 140 degrees Fahrenheit is usually maintained in an oven or a dehydrator. So a lot of dehydrators will have, um, I have one right back here that I will show you here in a minute. Um, they will have specific temperatures uh, that you'll need to do for um, certain types of foods. And then also the air circulation. So you want air circulation to be able to carry off any um, excess moisture. Um, <clears throat> but you also want to pre prevent that case hardening. And what that is, is that you're, um, you don't want to heat up the food too quickly because um, it will harden the outside of that food, but inside it's still um, very moist. And so it can cause spoilage uh, for that. Sun drying is also another option. Um, very high temperatures, very low humidity. <clears throat> it does cause le less money, and you can actually do large quantities of food. So sun drying is not ideal here. <laughs> In the southeast where there is um, a lot of humidity, um, you know, there's some days where it feels like it's 100% humidity um, for days on end. This is not ideal to do that here. However, if you live in the southwest part of the United States, um, this may be an option for you all because it is one of those that, um, you know, the humidity out there is, is very low. Um, and then, the, you know, the high temperatures that they get in the southwest too um, may be uh, ideal for this. So some foods that you can actually sun dry are fruits and legumes. And you'll see here, this is kind of a setup that they use. Um, and you want to make sure this is one of those, it's kind of a, it's a rack where it has the little holes in it so that there's air circulating um, at all times. The other option is um, solar drying. And so this actually requires less time, um, can actually be more sanitary because um, you kind of encased it in um, something. And then the initial cost and time to build um, the dryer can be high. Uh, weather is still um, in control, so um, it's the humidity outside can also um, be an, a factor into this. Um, there's no efficient way to control the temperature, and the quantity of food is limited based off of the size that you um, build this solar drying. So this is probably one of those that, um, you know, here in the southeast, it's not an ideal situation to do that because of the humidity. Um, but more, probably more ideal in the southwestern part of the United States um, where there is uh, low humidity and very high temperatures. The other option is vine drying. Um, and vine drying is typically done with legumes. So whether it is navy, kidney, butter, uh, great northern, lima, lentils, or soybeans. Um, and so basically the uh, bean pods are left on the vine to dry. And so how you can tell that they are dry is you, you know, lift one of those up and you shake it. And if it rattles, um, that means that the, um, the pods are dry and shriveled and you can actually shell the beans at that point. Um, there's no tr pretreatment is necessary. So if beans are still moist. The drying process is not complete and the beans will molt if not more uh, thoroughly dried. So if needed, drying can be completed in the sun, oven, or the dehydrator. 
Um, room drying is also an option. Um, so that whether this be in a sunny kitchen, uh, dust-free attic, a car or camper, um, one thing that a lot of people will do is they'll dry their herbs um, this way and so they'll string them up and um, put them in um, you know a place where in their home that's very dry but you know some of these like your attic and things like that it could be very dusty um, those type of things and so the room needs to be warm so no less than 80 degrees Fahrenheit and it actually has to have enough air circulation so low humidity is also desirable um, what to room to dry. Um, so like I was saying is herbs, those nuts in the shale, um, partially dry foods that are very, that are high in acid and sugar, and then also red chili peppers um, that are partially dried can be done indoors. But you also have, like I said, that temperature of that room has to be at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit and there has to be good air circulation. The other option is oven drying. Um, you can use this for fruits, uh, fruit leathers, vegetables, meats, fish, and cereals. Um, however, this is very costly because you are um, using your oven to do this, and it takes twice as long to do than it, um, in an oven than it does in a dehydrator. And you also have to make sure that your oven will go um, to 140 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Some ovens don't do that, so um, this may not be an option for you. And then also you have to have that air circulation um, to be able to do that. Dehydrators, um, this is probably the most common way that people will dehydrate their food is by using dehydrators. And so these are the, the self-contained with the heat source and ventilation uh, system for indoor drying. So there's two different um, types. You will have um, a better quality with these. Um, they can be in or near the kitchen. It doesn't have any other equipment that you might have and doesn't depend on the weather, uh, sanitary or minimal time to dry. So this is probably the best option uh, for most people is by using a dehydrator. So, the two different types are the vertical airflow and the horizontal airflow. So the horizontal airflow, um, the heating element and the fans are located on the side of the unit. So you'll see here down at the bottom, it's located on the side of the unit. Um, the major advantages of the horizontal flow are, are, is that it reduces the flavor mixture. So you can actually do several different foods. Um, can be dried at the same time if that specific um, model allows you to do that at that at the same temperature. Um, all trays receive the equal uh, heat penetration and juices or liquids uh, do not drip down into the heating element. Uh, whereas, you know, more of the horizontal one, uh, the heating element is sometimes either at the bottom um, of that food dehydrator or it could potentially be at the top. But with these vertical um, dehydrators you actually have to move the trays like every so often you have to go back and you have to rotate those trays just so that you that airflow is getting um, to all of those trays so that could be a downside to those vertical airflow ones um, some unacceptable methods of drying are using floor registers or microwave ovens do not use those either one of these to dry your foods for fruits, um, there are, it's optional to pre-treat them. Um, you know, one of the most common ways to do that is with the absorbic acid solution. Um, this is to help prevent that browning, a lot of browning for that. A lot of people will pre-treat their apples um, to keep them from browning too much. You can also do a quick blanch um, or blanching to help crack the skin because um, you, you got to penetrate that skin so you got to crack it somehow um, so that moisture can escape um, from that fruit. Pre-treating uh, vegetables, this helps sets the color, it helps shortens drying and rehydration times, it also kills uh, most organisms and destroys those enzymes and it also shortens the final cooking time um, rehydrating those vegetables. So to test for dryness in fruits, um, you want to um, make sure that there's no wetness. So when you squeeze the fruit or cut it, um, there's no moisture coming out of that. It's tough and pliable. 
um, when you pinch it, it'll spring back um, to where, where it's supposed to be at. And then for berries, they'll actually rattle whenever you shake them. For um, vegetables, they'll be very brittle or tough or crisp. Um, and actually some of them, if you were to drop them, they'll shatter. Um, so that's how you know that they are. Um, or if you hit them with a hammer, they'll shatter. So that can let you know if they are um, fully dried. The other thing that you wanna do um, post drying for treatment specifically for fruit um, is that they need to be conditioned. And so what this means is um, putting that fruit in a container, a lot of people will store them in canning jars um, and filling it about two thirds full. Um, and then every day going by and shaking that jar or stirring that jar um, for at least 10 to 14 days and to make sure that there's no condensation or spoilage on those um, items. The other thing that you'll need to do um, is pasteurization. And so you can either do it the freezer method or the oven method. Um, so sun-dried fruits and vine-dried beans need treatment to kill insects and in their eggs. So this can be done by either the freezer or the oven method. So the freezer method, uh, you'll seal the food in freezer type plastic bags, place the bags in a freezer uh, set at zero degrees Fahrenheit or below, and then leave them for at least 48 hours. The oven method, you'll place the food in a single, single layer uh, on a tray or a shallow pan and place in an oven preheated to 160 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. So jerky, um, Typically jerky um, is lightweight um, dried meat product. Um, it can be made mostly from any type of lean meat. So this includes beef, pork, venison, or smoked turkey breast. Uh, raw poultry is generally not recommended just because of the texture and the flavor of that finished product. Um, raw meats can actually be contaminated with microorganisms that cause disease. So these bacteria can actually multiply easily on moist and high protein foods such as meat and poultry. If pork or wild game is used to make jerky, the meat actually needs to be treated to kill the trichinella parasite before it's actually sliced or marinated. So to do this, you treat the meat, uh, you freeze a portion that's six inches or less thick at zero degrees or below for at least 30 days. And freezing does not eliminate bacteria from uh, meat. So if you are preparing a wild game, a wound location is vital for the safety of the meat. So if the animal was wounded um, where the guts come out or where the guts come in contact with the meat or as the animal is being dressed um, and came in contact with the person's hands, uh, fecal bacteria can contaminate the meat. So avoid making jerky from this meat that has been contaminated with that. Uh, deer carcasses uh, should be chilled rapidly to avoid bacteria growth um, and actually to decrease the risk of foodborne illness. Um, you'll allow the internal temperature of meat to reach 160 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, either by heating the meat strips in the marinade before drying or heating the dry jerky strips in an oven after the drying process is complete. Also, um, you know, for jerky, um, you know, if you are going to make jerky, um, it's, it's good to partially freeze that meat because uh, it just makes it easier to slice. Um, and you want to slice the meat no, no thicker than a quarter inch. Uh, you want to trim and discard all fat uh, from that meat because it can ra um, cause rancidity very quickly. Um, if you like a more chewy type, type jerky, you'll actually slice the meat with the grain of the meat. Um, if you want a more tender uh, type jerky or brittle type jerky, you want to slice across the grain of the meat. So drying processes um, for jerky, uh, you want to remove the strips from the marinade and drain on a clean and absorbent towels. Place those strips close together but not touching or overlapping them. Um, you want to place them in the dehydrator as a designated temperature for that dehydrator or preheated 140 degree Fahrenheit oven. You want to dry until a test piece cracks but doesn't break when it's bent. Um, it, it can take anywhere from 10 to 24 hours for samples not heated in marinade to dry. 
So typically meat that has been heated in the marinade will dry faster, so you wanna check those every three hours. Once drying is complete, um, pat off any beads of oil with clean absorbent towels and cool. And if the strips were not heated prior to dehydrating, place those strips on that baking sheet uh, close together, not touching or overlapping. And for those that were cut a quarter inch thick or less, um, heat for 10 minutes in a preheated oven at 204, or 275 degrees Fahrenheit. And those strips that were cut thicker um, may actually take longer to reach that 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So for storage of um, dried foods, uh, you wanna make sure that it's a food grade material. Um, you wanna store it for where it's 40 to 60 degrees is acceptable. You wanna avoid temperatures that are over 70 degrees. And you can also um, freeze them, uh, your dried goods uh, to extend the life of them. So typically for dried fruits, um, they last for six months to a year. Um, the vegetables, half the shelf life of the fruit. Uh, fruit leathers, one month unless they're frozen. And then meat jerky, um, they have a limited shelf life um, because of the fat that's remaining in the food and the possibility that it's become um, rancid. Um, so these are a couple of the resources and I'll show that here um, to you all here in a minute. So I'm going to stop the share um, so you can actually see, and Anastasia, can you see? Yes. Okay. Just up just a little. Okay. So um, a couple of different items. Um, that I'll show you all that you can uh, potentially purchase if this is something that you're wanting to do, whether it's um, freezing or drying. So um, for freezing, you can purchase a vacuum sealer here. Um, there's different brands that you can purchase. And so a lot of times what it is, very, it's fairly simple. Um, on this particular one, there's options for dry, for dry foods and for moist foods. Um, and there's a sealing option and then there's also a vacuum slash seal option. Um, so when you open it, a lot of times you do have to purchase um, the bags that go along with that. Um, so they're designed to be able um, to withstand the heat for that sealing. And so um, this particular one is already a pre-made bag for that. They also have rolls where you can make your own size of bags um, that you would like. Um, but you basically just place the open, you know, you stick your food in there um, and you place the open end into the, um, the vacuum sealer and then you lock it into place and then you just press, you make sure that it, uh, if, it if it was dry food that was in there, um, you make sure that it says on dry and then you press back and then seal and then you just kind of let it go um, however you want. Of course, I have a canning jar here um, that you all can um, use. Uh, to store your dry foods, or if you're wanting to freeze, you can also freeze in those canning jars. You also want to make sure um, that you purchase uh, freezer bags. Um, so if you plan on uh, freezing anything, um, purchasing these. And so you'll kind of see that there is um, a line here, and that typically that line lets you know that that's where you need to stop um, filling it so that you have enough of that headspace within this bag um, for to keep it from busting open. And a lot of people, like I was saying, you'll see that they'll actually freeze. Um, if they're uh, freezing like soups or something like that, um, they'll freeze them this way. And so when they're frozen, they'll actually come back through and they'll stack them like books um, just so that they um, can just pull them out that way. The other option um, for freezing as you'll see is I have a um, dish here, a glass dish that you can also freeze and thing, for things. You want to make sure that you leave that headspace so if you have, if you're freezing something that is liquid, whenever it, it, it expands it won't um, cause the lid to come off. And you'll also see here that I have some um, freezer paper here. And so the reason why I have this freezer paper is so that you can actually Whenever you get your uh, food product in here, you can actually press this down um, to where it's touching the top, um, the top of the food, and then you can put your lid on there. So that what that does is it helps push out any excess air that potentially could be in there. 
This here is a food dehydrator that I purchased um, to use at the office. And so this is one of the um, horizontal, yeah, horizontal um, dryers. And so this one, you'll see that it has different racks in it. Um, this particular one, so it has uh, spaces in here so that the air flows in it. Um, and then it also has a rack down here um, that will catch any of the juices or anything like that. So if you know that you have something um, that's gonna drip um, onto it, of course you wanna stack them towards the bottom. If you have things that are not, um, that are less likely to drip, of course you wanna stack them more to, towards the top. And this particular one, um, you don't have to worry about rotating it. You just have to come back through and check it and make sure um, that your food is being dry. And there are different settings. Uh, temperature settings on there uh, for you to use. So um, the dehydrators like are based on preference also uh, for that. All right. So Anastasia, is there any questions? And I'll yes, there was one. Uh, it says, "How long can I keep meat that was packaged frozen and kept in my in my freezer? For example." pork chops or sausage um, bought frozen at the farmer's market. Okay. Um, usually um, foods that have been frozen, um, if they've been kept frozen, they will be, they will um, last indefinitely. Um, however, you, um, the only risk that you run, if, if the temperature hasn't changed in that freezer, um, the other thing is making sure that um, um, freezer burn is the one thing, so that loses that quality of that. So um, a lot of times that you do, when you purchase things, um, you know, farmer's market and things like that, it will... Um, a lot of times they'll vacuum seal or vacuum pack, package their um, meats. And so that helps it last a little bit longer to, or helps with the um, freezer burn. Does that answer their question? Okay. <laughs> uh, and then are you familiar with any community canneries in the area or surrounding areas? So I know Washington County had one. Um, at one point in time, but the gentleman that was actually running it um, passed away, and so they weren't, they haven't been able to find somebody to help run that. Um, but I believe you can, uh, Mountain Harvest Kitchen in Unicoi County, just right over, um, just in Unicoi County, you can actually, um, you can rent out their space uh, to do canning if you choose, but, um, oh, the close, I, I mean, there's no one, there's not one that's close by that's um, feasible for us to use. Is there a website for the so easy to preserve? It's not showing on the screen. Um, let me see. Okay. Is it showing now? The, no. Oh, this is so easy to preserve. Um, yeah, so so easy to preserve is one of those. If you are interested in purchasing um, the book, because this book, because I showed it last time, if we were on last week, um, I had it for canning, but it also has things in here for freezing and drying. Um, you know, if there's like a marinade or something like that that you want for um, beef jerky or something like that. Um, they do have it in here. So, um, but I'll have something um, online. So I'll do a little post online um, that hopefully you could potentially, you know, grab one of these for free and do a little contest. So. And if you, if you don't win the contest, I just posted the link to order the book um, in the chat feature. Yes. Any other questions?
Okay. Well, thank you all um, for joining us this evening. Um, next week, I will be posting, I won't be actually doing a Zoom meeting um, for, for this, but I will be doing a um, jams and jellies one and then also i've been working on a video to do to show you all how to do low sugar uh, strawberry jam so that will be posted on youtube next week